Okay, hello to everyone. Here is a lead scene and together with Noah, today we're meeting our friends from Utopia in Practice in Action. Uh, the idea is to have a, a lovely conversational together and Noah will explain a bit better uh, which will be the contents of this meeting today. Yeah, thank you. Um, so the what we have proposed for this conversation is to share the first round a little bit about ourselves and and the vision of if our project accomplishes its full utopia, how would that look like? Um, so we have people working in different projects, and I think that usually it it is it's not so natural and spontaneous for us to go that far with our imagination to to what what happens what it what does it look like if we actually have our dream 100 percent happening so we wanted to to push it a bit in in that direction and then if we have time for a second round we're going to talk about how that is actually going in in practice what have we learned so far what are the challenges and maybe we can exchange ideas for each other's projects on how to move forward, how to deal with these challenges. So uh, I will invite Josada to start. Okay, hello everyone. Um, so I start by pre presenting myself, that's right. A little introduction. So well, as I said before, I just um, finished my master degree in fashion here in Brazil, and actually, actually starting a little bit uh, before that, uh, I always have this uh, this thought about sustainability, and when it shows uh, the opportunity of studying this in the university, I started to to do that so and in my master degree I studied the project Armário Coletivo collective cabinet here in Brazil and uh, the contents of, in this project um, took my attention because the, the utopia is there but uh, not in the beginning I saw this uh, I didn't saw this at the first place but the new economies are uh, things that take my attention. Well, uh, well, I guess I, I can speak about the project before, but um, besides this master degree, I am an artist, a textile artist, and, and my first formation actually was in design, product design. And I have this, um, I have this look for new practices in these areas, um, especially in design and fashion, because I guess we have lots of thing, things and energy and mat materials um, in the world right now. And I guess my, my thought of Utopia was like I, I, I wrote in the, the resume it's that we maybe stop the, the industry and um, use what, what is already in the world. Um, so I guess, I guess that's it. I, I don't know what, what I can tell anymore about myself and the project, but I'm a little bit nervous actually. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's it. Um, right now, we are starting uh, other projects that we call like arms of the Amario Colectivo. That is this, this collective cab cabinets that are on the streets, the universities, schools, high schools. And I, I don't know, I, I will just uh, introduce the project. In these cabinets, we put there what we no longer use, but that is in, in, a, in a good, um, in a good way to others to use. And lots of things that are there in the cabinets actually stays there for a long time. And Karina, the, the woman that starts the project, that actually I called more a movement than a, than a project today. Um, 
she she develops uh, lots of projects in that uses this material like um, textiles, jeans. Uh, the most the most shared uh, items in the the, the collect the collective cabinets is uh, clothing. It's clothes. So we are right now the de develop the de development of this uh, course to to women in uh, maybe no one can help me uh, mulheres in situação extramuros extramuros uh, prisão domiciliar enfim de, ou pós uh, pós cumprimento de pena né I'm not sure how to say that in English um, <laughs> yeah. Go for it. Let's use this word. So, <laughs> women that are after they have been in prison and they have to, and they are still under ah service under special service, like they are, like they have to work. Like they are not anymore in prison, but they have to help the society, something like that. Dom domestic prison, I guess. I mean, I not the best, <laughs> the best concept. But anyways, well, the, the focus of this project is to uh, take the sustainability of this, these materials and use what is, as example, in the collective covenants and uh, help this woman to maybe have a, a, a work to, to do with that, to learn more about um, manual process in, in fashion. So there is lots of arms in, the, in this project that are going on, are happening. And I guess here in, here in Florianopolis, we, we are really thinking about that, um, that question of uh, trash and, and landfills and to not dispose of so much stuff. I guess that's it. that's it. If you if you guys have some questions, that's so beautiful to hear and inspiring. Can I um, thank you for so like the the full utopia? Let's imagine like so you said like there are no industries happening and we're using and reusing what's in the world. So do we have like collective closets, collective cabinets? in every block, in every neighborhood, the community is managing it, women that have been in prison are participating in, in the cycle, are there no prisons at all, like how, how far can we go with this or say we still have to, to have some transitioning processes for, for people that are in conflict with, with society, so how can this process of sharing and, and creation make this um, in a utopian positive ideal way i mean you don't have to answer all these questions there, there are many but just like a little push if, if you want to what question i'm sorry the question is yeah. if, do you like if if the utopia becomes true for what we are trying to achieve for what you and these people um and these women and and karina are trying to achieve through the collective closet and the adjacent projects like the like this one you you told us about with with the women if if we have absolute success and all our dreams come true then how does it look like I, I think a lot about freedom of all beings, not just human, because well, if if we think of not cons consume that much that we we are used to, we have more time, we have more money to put on on things that really are really important. So for this woman, in specific, I guess this freedom of well ha have have something and I, I, I'm not talking about a work to make money or whatever, but someone that is thinking about them and is going there to, to share the knowledge 
and the possibilities there there is out there because sometimes we we think well like i have to to buy a material to sell to seal something to embroider anyway i have to to buy something that is new uh, a raw material but actually there is a abundance of of stuff and i like to think about it i i just learned that from karina that when we we think of abundance as, as a paradigm that already exists it will not um will not have the the lack of of um, stuff in life but not just stuff also the the, the experiences and when I, when i think of this utopia Gary more real because it's already real but we know we have lots of challenges but when i think this utopia getting real i i think of um this freedom and a world with less uh, production and disposal mostly and i get i get i guess I, th that's it with with your question i really thought about this this freedom of put our precious time in things that that matters i don't know if i <laughs> if i yes can add the thoughts can add the thoughts <clears throat> just yesterday <clears throat> i was attending a um, a meeting uh, held by Professor Paulis, I guess, about the growth, about the growth, I mean, instead of growth, the growth. And actually, what are you telling now that's much more connected with the, uh, you know, the um, to find an alternative solution to the high production uh, that is connected with the growth. Actually, I made image for the like the idea, the, the utopian vision will be much more connected with uh, the growth system. So a system, as a society that is not based on the uh, only on the growth idea. Without this growth idea, you can you can't go ahead. But something that is much more like you know to slow down somehow. And so uh, it's something it looks to me like because one of the challenge of the, the growth. It's really to think something that practical can be connected with the, 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 the growth theory. It looks to me at least, but sh this should be for sure more, for more developed, that anyway could be like uh, at the growth example, what you are talking about in the future. So just to add a layer of thoughts about this. Sure. Thank you. There is a, uh, there is cool. a, thanks. There is a term actually in Portuguese, um, the crescimento, I guess, is the same that, that you're talking about. Yes, and yes. I, I, I am from this area of sustainability studies and um, the most uh, literature that we, we read talks about the um, sustain sustainability de development, I guess. And then some some authors and some utopians, some revolutionaries talks about this decrescimento, the growth, I guess it's the same. Because we cannot think about uh, sustainability in a, in a large way without thinking that, well, maybe we we should stop a little bit and think about what we really need and what we have to produce. And think about the, this development as a, a def development in connection with nature and other people and other species. So yeah, I guess it's it's a, a really nice term to, to think about. Yeah, well, this issue is socio-ecological justice. Maybe with this we can jump to Margot. Yeah. Uh, to to ask Margot, well, something about you, if you agree with this, and then to share with your experience. Uh, I think it's a very good exercise to think, uh, like uh, to push a bit as Noah was telling before, and tell us, Margot, uh, how you image, uh, like uh, in a more utopian way, uh, your project if it could be accomplished totally the utopian vision you have. Totally. I also, I finally remembered, Drusara, I think the word you're looking for was either. 
formerly incarcerated women or women on parole, potentially like on house arrest. I don't know if any of the, those are all <laughs> potential terms. I was like, it finally hit me. Thank um, you for the for writing. Yeah. And um, I want to talk a little bit more about the growth too, after I like explain this project. I think it's really an interesting framework and um, related to like the vision of utopia that that I have and that Fundacion Kambugan has with the uh, with the Mushuk Tukoi um, agro agroecological network and um, the name is in Quechua which I do not speak and I am for sure pronouncing it incorrectly but it means um, new beginning or rebirth and the idea of the network is to help um, rural and indigenous Quechua women uh, just outside of Quito in Ecuador achieve food sovereignty um, through taking ownership over production um, of agricultural products in ways that are uh, harmonious with the earth systems. So sharing like traditional knowledge of how to grow produce in this particular area and how to use like irrigation systems that are in line with the natural flow of water and seeds that like and like turnover across multiple years so that the soil will stay fertile um, and all in ways that are not just like causing the destruction of the native ecosystems, but actually restoring the native ecosystems in the area. So similar a little bit to the food forest that, that you were working on, Noah, this is in a more rural area, trying to uh, grow, grow food in ways that bring back like native flora and fauna that were um, leaving the area as the native ecosystems were being destroyed. And part of what's happened in this land area is that it used to be all farming. And then with people starting to get more and more jobs in the city, they switched to livestock, like maintaining livestock and it's um, destroying the, the native ecosystems. Um, so the network is bringing together ways of women's active leadership and participation in agricultural production, which also has been taken over by men and there's like a huge issue of gender-based violence and domestic violence because women have no like ownership over land and no property and so this is a way of trying to help rural and indigenous women achieve economic autonomy food sovereignty and restore uh, the native ecosystems um, and it's all through operating as a network so people are supporting each other um, supplying each other with seeds, with tools, helping to distribute the produce as it's needed throughout the community. Uh, and I think, I think that the utopian vision on the scale of um, Pinta, the, the area and, and the um, Kamugan watershed, that's the area that's being restored. The utopian idea there would be that this entire community is able to supply its own food and that um, women are leading the design and the production processes and that the ways that food is being produced is completely in harmony with the native ecosystems in the area. Um, so on, on a larger scale that could look like communities everywhere across the world supplying their own food. Um, and it would be really interesting to see how that happens in urban spaces and cities, but instead of like going to a store and having this dis disconnection from like where the food is made, who's making it, where the nutrients are coming from, where's, where's the soil that it was grown, where's the water it was grown, having a deeper connection to where the food is made and, and who's involved in the process and circulating, like having a circular economy where if you're not producing your own food, you're giving money or resources back to the community because that's where the food is coming from. Instead of sending it away to multinational corporations, it's keeping, it's keeping the food production system local. Amazing, that sounds beautiful. Um, I think one question that came to my mind while you were speaking is, um, and, and then it, it's a tangent, but I think it's interesting when we talk about gender equality and women empowerment, um, if we think about accomplished utopia, is it still 
mostly led by women or do we reach gender balance and there is collaboration with equal distribution of powers between women, men and any other genders that are around. Um, and also, um, I think it's really interesting what you say about um, if people aren't in directly involved in producing their food, then they're still like investing in the community because that's where the food comes from. So I was wondering about how the, how the division of, of roles, how the division of work would happen in, in a utopian society and like, are people um, happy to produce food? Because today we have this like, let this constant growing loss of people that want to dedicate to agriculture. So does that come back to being something that people want to do? Does it, how, how do we, yeah, I think the question is, is done. Like how, how are, how is the work distribution, the work division in society happening? If you have any thoughts, I know these are all like very <laughs> questions. <laughs> No, totally. I think the first one is one I think about a lot with um, the difference between gender equality and gender equity, right? Or gender parity. And right now we live in a world where, and, and you know, in Pintag, in, in this particular location in Ecuador, also throughout the world, in the place where I live in Massachusetts, we value um, masculine traits so much more than feminine. And so in the, like, the people who hold power, who are making decisions, who own land are mo like almost entirely men. And like we're seeing a really recent shift, right? Where we're starting to value women's perspectives and opinions and not just women, but also gender non-conforming people. So like anyone who is not a man um, is valued as less in our society. So to get to a point where we can have real equality we have to first shift the balance so that women are in order to have women's voices be equally heard and gender non-conforming people's voices be equally heard they need to be in positions of leadership we have to shift we have to shift the value system and so to get there in order to have it be a point of equity we need more of those people in leadership positions and making decisions and i think that's why there's the emphasis on women-led um, and to the second part of your question, my question I is like, like after the value shift has happened, and ah, then how is it? Yeah, because also then uh, I know that um, Indian traditions do have a, a clear division of work between genders, and I don't want us to to go like and and tell anyone what to do, but we're just playing with our imagination and like playing with not necessarily what would happen there, but what we envision as like our utopia, learning from all these different places and cultures and movements and projects. Totally. In that, in that way, yeah, I, in the utopian vision, uh, everyone has a role and roles are valued equally. And we have men and women and people of all genders actively involved in leadership roles and making decisions. And it's at that point, um, I think we would have many women leaders and many leaders who are men and, and it wouldn't feel like an imbalance. Um, and the way that power is held wouldn't feel like an imbalance. That's such an interesting, I won't enter, but just to mention that how would it feel like to participate in a society where power does not feel like imbalance? Isn't that an intriguing question? <laughs> but I'll let you go back to, yeah. And also with uh, thinking about power, actually, uh, I have a, let's say a question, but is it so connected with the doubts that I had in the, for, about the project? So you say that it's connected with, as well, um, the land properties. I didn't get very well if uh, the project aims also to, you know, collect some collective properties, if this question makes sense in a way that a collective subject can own a land and then to share the duty and the beauty to, to you know, uh, cultivate a land 
Um, that will be interesting otherwise because we are in a very capitalistic pri pri uh, privatized system in which it's kind of very complicated to have co to, to own collectively a land. And the, to own a land, speak about power, it's actually one of the way many companies and corporations own power. So the idea to challenge this, uh, this power system based on the land by using in a collective way and to own in a collective way a land, to me, is a very uh, you know, huge utopian that also in a very practical way, once you achieve that utopian, really challenge the current unbalanced power system right now. So the question is a bit, uh, if uh, it's always an issue, practically speaking, and in the utopian vision you have, how you deal with this, how you deal with these collective properties of the land. If I am, um, if it was good, I mean, it's clear. I think so. Can you hear me okay? There's a, I'm, there's a big truck next to me. <laughs> also, um, also next to me right now. So I, I yeah. Tell me. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I think it's an awesome question. And uh, right now it's still, the land is still divided. So individual people have their own plots of land in our, um, are managing their own plots of land. In the utopian vision, it's, it would be collective land and people collectively making decisions about how the land is used and how it's being farmed and how it's being used for other activities. And that is where, that's where I'm struggling right now in, fig, like, in figuring out what that kind of community governance looks like. And there are a lot of like structures we have to work off of to see how it works on a small scale but community governance at a larger scale, um, so, so messy and decision-making so hard. Um, but I would love to see there be like more than just like community gardens. Like what would community, what would community farms look like or community food forests on like a, on a bigger scale. Um, and I think that also kind of gets a little bit back to Noah's question of like, how do we get, how do we share that labor? Because right now we're not in a place where there's like nearly enough uh, agricultural production happening to, to provide that utopian vision, right? Where communities are like supplying their own food. And I, I think that one part of it is, is value shifting. Like right now in our capitalist society, we don't value agricultural production. Like we don't value farmers and farm workers as much as we do like doctors and lawyers um, because they don't get paid as much so in our like in our economic capitalist system if you don't make as much money like you're not seen as much as like as valuable of a worker so we have to shift we have to shift that value system so that we value agricultural production just as much as we value medicine and um and I think it would also be partly through having this kind of like collective land ownership where people like some people who are like more excited about doing more of the labor are doing more of the agricultural labor but then everybody is playing a hand in in like maintaining a little bit of of the structure and i think that's really hard to maintain like you can't you can't force anyone to be engaged in agricultural work if they don't want to be but how so how do we make people want to be I think that's the that's the hard question. And I think an interesting point also when we imagine how that utopia would look like is the place of machines, because it it seems like in, in a first superficial thought that there is a contradiction between like agroecology and machinery, but it is being thought and, and developed and it can be used in a way that will free humans from part of the hard labor and is it something that we want or is hard labor also something rewarding that some people want to do and of course we can always go with the option of having diversity different farms working in, in different systems but i think that's interesting to to imagine as well like what will be the place the place of, of technology and what will be the place of human labor and how will human labor feel like and, and look like so that people want to do it in a utopia where everyone is happy doing all the kinds of work that they are doing? 
So yeah, thank you for sharing, Margot. It's really also inspiring and, and stimulating. Um, we have like, let's say that we were thinking to do more or less one hour of meeting in order also to, yeah, let, uh, let you free to enjoy the rest of the day. It was super amazing. I think in these 10 minutes, if you are still available to stay together with us, we can, uh, you know, make the effort to um, try to understand the, from a practical point of view, to explore the tension between these utopian visions we have just, you know, shared together with what I've learned from your experience in action uh, from the field. Maybe we can try to put a bit on the table together uh, how the experience on the field, for instance, has fed or has sometimes stopped or changed your, your vision, your utopian vision, and try to understand which was, you know, the biggest maybe challenge or the biggest opportunities uh, you have met on the way. That could be, uh, yeah, let's say I thought we can, we can do this tension between vision that is, it looks something very long-term, very abstract, even if it's not, then to the tension with the practical experience. Uh, if you agree with this, also you, know, maybe we can have a short reflection on this. And yeah, tell me, maybe we can start from Isara again, um, yeah. I have just uh, two thoughts about what Margot shared. I was just taking notes to, to remember. Um, the, the first thing that I, I thought it was about the, the non necessity of money exchange when we grow our own foods, maybe think maybe thinking about uh, well, in, in my community, my house in, in small places. And the, the, the last thing that, that you said uh, about the lack of the interest in agriculture, because all of us have to, to eat and eat well, but most of us uh, won't uh, take the, the things and put in the, in the earth to grow and plant our own foods. There is a huge job and a huge work, and we don't do that. So I, I just thought about about these this two two things, the the non necessity of money exchange that for me it's, it's a utopia, and and this this lack of interest in, in in agriculture, and how we we sometimes lost mo uh, lost most of this this interest in. And I'm sorry, I I just lost the the question, Lizzie. It's just to finish the the. Uh, Maybe since we have Cole back, we can hear yeah. from Cole the, if, if you want to share Cole. The question is, um, if the project or projects in which you are involved get to accomplish their full utopia, that full vision comes true, then how does it look like? How does, as far as like in, in their current locality or if, it goes to the whole world and we're living the dream. How does that look like? And of course, you can also introduce yourself and, and then talk, tell us about that. Okay. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, good morning, My, or good whatever time it is for you. Um, yeah, my name is Cole. I'm a farmer and artist and organizer here in Huchin, occupied Ohlone territory, also known as Berkeley, Oakland. Um, I, yeah, um, what would it look like if this utopian vision were realized? Um, it's such an interesting question. You know, I think, I think like the approach that I kind of took from your prompt, Noah and Lizzie was like imagining what utopia looks like for other beings besides humans. Um, I was imagining like what, <clears throat> and sort of, I think by, by, by asking that question, I sort of 
stumbled on this idea that, or this feeling, this sense, this like felt, felt sense that utopia as, and I love what you said, Noah, at least in one of your messages recently of it being no place. I didn't realize that was like the etymology of utopia, but like you meaning no, and then topia being placed. So no, no place. Um, and I felt this intuitive sense that the utopia already exists for for the the butterflies and for the insects and like um, there's this felt sense in which like it is already realized. Um, you know they they have this place that's built for them here, and it's like of course their migration is and their and their population is just like absolutely decimated um, by pollution and ecological collapse and climate change but but then yeah so I, I i feel like if 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 utopia was realized in like the way that i was conceiving of it um Yeah, I, I like. I'm imagining like a bee, like curled inside of a fl of these flowers, you know, and like the way that there's just in a whole field of marigold and milkweed and mustard, and you know, in some ways, it's sort of like the same idea that like the the apocalypse has already come for indigenous people. You know, people say, "Oh, it's the apocalypse." It's like, well. The apocalypse already happened for indigenous people in North America and other parts of the world, right? We're already living in the post-apocalypse, right? There's no, there's no apocalypse that's going to come. We're already in, we're already in the post-apocalyptic world. And it's the same with utopia. It's like, we're already in the utopia um, and the butterflies know it. We just have to like learn to see with their eyes. So I'm, I'm kind of like interested in like playing with that, you know, um, and the sort of non-linearity of, of, of no place, if that makes any sense at all. <laughs> yes, can I, can I enter and, and add, um, yeah, for just a little note about the etymology of utopia, it has an ambig ambiguity of O utopia, which would be no place, and E utopia, which would be happy place. So that's the game of the origin. It, it does not exist, but it is happy, which means that somehow it exists in in a no place, which is somewhere. Um, and I wanted to ask you um, if you want to tell us a bit about the concrete things that that the concrete utopias that you've been engaging in in your video. We have this beautiful poetic vision. But um, just to say, like one of the things that I think are most amazing about the, like the utopian traces of what's happening there is like a farm on, on an occupied land has become the place with the biggest monarch butterflies population in the area. Um, so that is amazing. So yeah, I just wanted you to tell very briefly, we don't have a lot of time and thank you all for your time if we can extend it a few minutes beyond um and then yeah just a, an ad, extra little provocation about like this tension between maybe in a butterfly's eye eyes um utopia is there like bees and flowers and the sky and the water and i i believe this is what i'm understanding from from what you're bringing from like butterflies utopia utopia is already real and at the same time what if the butterfly can dream even further and have like their whole family expand again and the ecosystem come back then how does the butterfly utopia go for further whatever you want to share around that <laughs> well i don't want to take up all the time i also apologize my phone died i was out in the on the land and then so i'm grateful to be here i, I want to hear from others too and i'm sorry that i like was you late can watch later it's recording okay, okay. <laughs> yeah I, I mean i work at you know i work at these two farms one of them is called quail creek or the gill tract community farm it was occupied 
in 2011. It's still an occupation. It's one of the few examples of a successful land occupation on Turtle Island. You know, we see this as a strategy, as a political mobilization strategy in other parts of the world, right? But we rarely see it implemented in North America, certainly in the United States is what I'm really, really mean, I guess. And so, um, yeah, and it's still a land occupation. And that's now being done in concert with the Lishan Ohlone, the original people of this land. So through the Sigorte Land Trust, so um, indigenous women leading the way and on that land where they've been rematriating the land and doing ceremony has now over the last two years become one of the largest monarch butterfly overwintering sites in all of California. And that's just happened since these indigenous women have come back and brought prayer back to the land have brought ceremony and medicine making back to the land. Um, and I don't think that's an accident. You know, I think those things are connected. Um, so I think, you know, if I, if I had to like take you up on like, oh, what will the vision be? I, I think it's about ceremony and prayer and the sacred. And I think the monarchs sort of inscribe these sort of sacred um, textures to the landscape. They're very sensitive beings. They're incredibly attuned to energy. You know, they, they choose specific trees um, at our site. They're not just like going anywhere randomly. They like go to the same spot on the same tree every year. You know, we're talking about beans that travel thousands of miles. They weigh less than a penny and they have this incredible, incredible intuitive energetic instrument that allows them to, to, to navigate in this in with incredible precision. So I think you know, I think that's the sort of utopian dream or vision of the monarch is like this incredible um, sensitivity and sort of a ceremony or ritual of, of deep listening, um, deep awareness, and of, of um, yeah, that's probably enough for me. That's very beautiful. Thank you, Cole. And I was imagining what if, yeah, what if we learn to navigate with incredible precision like butterflies? Yeah, and I also That's have really to cool. say that uh, in comparison to we have discussed it together with Margot and Yusara, I think um, your, you know, your experience and what also you share with us uh, really, you know, bring in all the interspecies and socio-ecological relations. Uh, relationship that's something we discussed but it's in a more you know patent way to reflect on how you interact right now and you can interact in a better way uh, with yeah with the environment with a uh, human more the human communities and also how to include them in a more future vision so this is really add the added value that is very you know inspiring and very interesting for to me so thank you so much Thank you so much. It's so nice to be here with you. Um, I will end the recording and we can stay just for another minute to talk off the record. And thank you for- Yeah, uh, maybe before you watching. stop the recorder, yeah. before you stop, you stop. So the idea actually of the, the panel was, you know, to collect all this amazing, cool experience that to follow visions that are practical, but practical in action in some part of everywhere in the world. And the idea, our idea is to really, you know, uh, to create a connection through this panel to this conference among all the experience and also to keep continuing like talking and be in contact. So it's possible that we will, may, we will have some other future exchanges. And this is our bit, our idea. Uh, with this excuse, Noah and Hi, we will learn a lot too, from uh, like from you. Uh, we would like also to be, let's say, useful since we are inside the academia, but use it in a way that is like to really put together people that are doing amazing things in, around in the world. So that's the bit our, let's say, one of our, our goals. So thank you so much for joining us and, and to yeah, achieve together a better world. Thank you, Lizzie.